Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my seconder from the Bloc Québécois for his support for my motion. In a position at report stage, that were it not for a motion passed in committee that is identical to every other committee's motion to uh, reduce my rights as a member of parliament, I would be able to submit today at report stage substantive and detailed amendments uh, such as I had to do before committee. I raise this now, Mr. Speaker, and, and previous speakers have ruled that this um, discriminatory procedure, the first time in the history of parliament that a majority Parliament, uh, the majority of MPs in the House, at the request of a Prime Minister's office, have reduced the rights of individual members of Parliament who have this artificial threshold. Only Canada, within Westminster parliamentary democracies, has this rule that there's such a thing as a recognized party, uh, and that below 12 seats, you're not a recognized party. It's unique to Canada, but I digress. The, the, the rights I would have without the PMO-directed motions identical in every committee dreamt up under former Prime Minister Harper's PMO and repeated under this Prime Minister's PMO reduced the rights of MPs such as myself to present detailed substantive emo emo amendments at report stage. Um, this is called a, an opportunity and I put the opportunity in quotes. I'm using air quotes as I stand here but for the benefit of Hansard. This is not an opportunity. This is a coercive process in which my amendments are deemed to have been presented. So I do want to make note of the fact that this procedure has become increasingly difficult, uh, running from committee to committee, sometimes uh, clause by clause of different committees happen at exactly the same moment. In this case, my amendments to committee went forward, and I have to say I regret very much that my substantive opportunity to speak to these uh, motion amendments was precluded by illness. So I wanted to put on the record that I had more detailed, targeted, substantive amendments. They were all defeated in my absence. I think they clearly would have been defeated had I been there. But I did want to thank the Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway for, in my absence, attempting to argue that my amendments had merit and attempting to help some of them get through. So now at report stage, I'm precluded from putting forward substantive amendments, uh, as the Speaker will know, and I'm bringing forward deletions of those sections of the bill that are most difficult. Uh, let's step back and explain what the difficulty is. For members such as myself, uh, I lead the Green Party of Canada, the first party in Canada to call for the legalization of cannabis. Uh, that is for the reason that is cited so often by government members in explaining why the Liberal Party campaigned on the legalization of cannabis. It's very clear that prohibition of cannabis is a failed policy. It's very clear that prohibition of cannabis uh, profits primarily organized crime and feel, fuels an underground economy whose main beneficiaries are, it, it, are people in organized crime. It's clear that it takes people who are otherwise honest, law-abiding Canadians and gives them a criminal record. There are, there are many ills that come from the failed policy of prohibition. But one of them particularly is, is that it uh, fuels grow-ups, which take up residents in otherwise calm, quiet residential cul-de-sacs, and gang wars <laughs> that break out have, in some cases, um, criminals have broken into the homes of innocent people because they think it's a rival grow up. In some cases, police have kicked down the doors of otherwise legal um, and, well, people who are completely not, not involved in grow ups, but there's been mistaken identity cases because quiet neighborhoods can breed grow ups. So I'm entirely in favor of anything that takes away the profit making criminal activity in trafficking and growing cannabis. This legislation, therefore, is something that I should be able to support 100 percent. And the reason I can't is that it appears that in drafting this legislation, the governing liberals were seized with something of a schizophrenia. On one hand, they want to legalize cannabis. On, on one hand, they recognize the overwhelming scientific evidence that there's nothing in the evidence of, for instance, the World Health Organization or other organizations focused on health that would make the case that cannabis is more dangerous or more addictive than otherwise legal substances that we also know are health hazards, such as tobacco and alcohol. They approached this drafting of cannabis legislation 
with the apparent intention, as publicized during the election campaign, of legalizing cannabis. But at the same time, they seem to be carrying a prohibition mindset into a legalization drafting. So I wanted to quote from one of the witnesses before the committee, Michael Spratt, who is a, a well-known and respected criminal lawyer. He's appeared a number of times before parliamentary committees, and I've drawn on his evidence in the past. I find him compelling. This is from an article he published under the title, Marijuana Bill, Another Example of Liberals' Broken Promises. And what he says is this, and I quote, when it comes to legalization of marijuana, it, it seems that the liberals will keep their promise, sort of. They pledged to legalize marijuana because it, quote, traps too many Canadians in the criminal justice system, close quote. Because illegal weed funds criminal organizations and because legal but regulated cannabis keeps, better keeps drugs away from our children. So in 2015, the liberals promised to, quote, remove marijuana consumption and incidental possession from the criminal code, close inner quote. Continuing with Michael Spratt's article, quote, the liberals proposed cannabis bill actually doesn't do any of these things very well. Sure, the legislation does legalize some marijuana, some of the time, under some circumstances, but it does not, quote, remove marijuana consumption and possession from the criminal code. In reality, the new bill is an unnecessarily complex piece of legislation that leaves intact the criminalization of marijuana in many circumstances. So my attempt, Mr. Speaker, is in this deletion to remove the risk that the distribution, which is defined as not selling, so this is the distribution basically giving uh, a cannabis substance that in some situations is legal and in other situations is not legal, the situation which is not legal, is to provide it to anyone under 18 years old. Now, I understand it's illegal to sell alcohol, depending on the province, to a minor. It's illegal to sell cigarettes to a minor, and so it should be. But this legislation is sending out a signal that says cannabis is far more dangerous than cigarettes or alcohol. There's no evidence for that. It's sending out a message that if you are 18 years old and ingesting cannabis, that's legal. But if you pass it to a friend who's in the same year as you in high school, and you think they're 18 but they're not, the onus is on you that you tried to find out how old they were before you passed the joint to your friend. Because otherwise you could spend 14 years in jail. This is an extreme punishment that is completely tone deaf to the liberal campaign to legalize cannabis. It's out of sync with all the evidence. I don't understand how we could imagine for a moment, I hope judicial discretion will step in, but I can't imagine for a moment why we would think that someone who, without a profit motive, without any idea that what they're doing is illegal, distributes, that is to say, gives for free to a, uh, someone they know, some cannabis, but that person happens to be under 18, that that opens them up to a very harsh criminal sanction of 14 years in jail. There are other pieces of the legislation that I attempted to amend in committee, uh, including treatment of edibles. This is something that, in terms of assistance to people who have need of medical marijuana, is a safer way of ingesting for many people than smoking. We're making a little progress there out of committee. I have to say it was, it was good to see the, the majority liberals accept amendments to remove some of the sillier provisions, such as a height restriction on the height of plants, there was some uh, progress in increasing the amount that can be possessed before you uh, have uh, hit the, cr the criminal mark. But the Good Samaritan exception, again, credit to the Liberals for accepting that amendment. But the, crim and the again, the, the height restriction has, uh, at 100 uh, centimeters has been removed. But much more could have been done to fix this bill in committee. We can still make progress here at report stage by accepting uh, this amendment. I, I applaud the Liberals for the intent to legalize cannabis, but I decry the fact that this legalization is contaminated with a prohibition mindset that undoes a lot of what was promised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park.
North Saskatchewan. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have substantive differences with the member about her assessment of the risks, and I think the medical evidence bears out clearly uh, significant associations between marijuana use and mental health challenges, certainly things we want to avoid. I do want to ask the member about her comments with respect to the standing orders. I, uh, I don't go out of my way to agree with the government, but the way that the standing orders and combinations with the motions that have been passed that I think most committees, if not all, work is that now every member has an opportunity to bring forward substantive amendments in committee and thus they cannot bring amendments at report stage that they could, not, could have brought forward at committee. The member in question wants to have the right to bring forward substantive report stage amendments. I understand that, but as a member of a, of a major recognized party, I'm not able to bring forward substantive amendments at report stage either, except in uh, certain very particular circumstances which would apply to the member as well, in which there's a, 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 a great importance to the measure evaluated by the Speaker, which, which makes for an exception. So I wonder if the member should, could clarify that in this case, what she's asking for is, is actually a right that other members don't have because nobody can bring forward substantive amendments at report stage if those could have been brought forward in committee. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Island. I really appreciate my friend from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, allowing me to amplify on this point. The reason that members of large recognized parties don't have the right to bring forward substantive member motions at report stage is relatively new. It was a response to the over 700 amendments brought forward on the NISCA Treaty by what was, I think, then not the Conservative Party, but the Reform Party. The majority Liberals at that point took it to PROC, where, generally speaking, if we're going to change the way legislation moves to the House, it gets done at PROC. And those rights to bring forward amendments, and which is, again, a derogation of the individual right of every MP. We're all equals. We're not here elected as blocks of different parties. So this reduced the rights of every member in this place who's a member of the Liberals, the NDP, or the Conservatives, because if one of your colleagues sits on a committee, you don't get brought forward the chance to bring forward amendments here. Now, that provision is one that I think is unfortunate, but it did go through PROC and it did change the standing orders. For members such as myself who are not allowed to sit on any committees, we're given a fake opportunity, a false opportunity, to, be, to have amendments brought forward in our name and, and deemed moved, Members in positions such as myself are not allowed to sit on the committee, put forward questions to witnesses. It's a fake, less opportunity for the sole purpose of depriving me of a right I would have had but for the motions passed in every committee. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I would actually commend the our Parliamentary Secretary on health in terms of just being able to deal with what is a very important issue. And if I was to uh, best describe it, it is to uh, minimize the, the impact on uh, cannabis uh, for our young people. Uh, today we have uh, more young people than virtually any other country in the Western world that are uh, consuming uh, uh, cannabis in some form or another. And we finally have a government that's really recognizing that we need to, to do something and deal with the, the criminal element, the hundreds of millions that goes towards crime uh, uh, as a direct result. Having said that, uh, Madam Speaker, or Mr. Speaker, the, the leader of the Green Party indicated that uh, she had a problem with the legislation. There was an aspect of the legislation where someone was 18 years old, sitting in a high school, and possibly going to jail for 14 years if they passed a, a, a cigarette to someone that is 17. And yes, that's that is something which I'll, I'm quoting the leader of the Green Party. My question to the leader of the Green Party is, does she not believe that when you take a look at that eight, same 18-year-old, maybe possibly passing it off to someone that would be 14 years old or 13 years old as being problematic if her amendment had been passed? Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, the, the reality of the way this bill has been drafted is, again, the sentencing is extreme for, and again, this expert testimony before the committee from many people in, who are uh, representing the Criminal Lawyers Association, individuals who have day-to-day -day experience with defending people. We have a lot of people in this country whose um, personal reputations are, continue to be stigmatized because of being charged with a crime that, as the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary pointed out, we have a population of people who have used um, recreational cannabis uh, far 
higher proportion of our population than other populations. So many people who are otherwise law-abiding have used recreational cannabis over the years and are stigmatized with a criminal record. This legislation should remove that risk of stigmatization, but it perpetuates it. And again, to my friend from uh, uh, Fort Saskatchewan, uh, from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, the medical evidence from the World Health Organization, the report from the Canadian Senate, is really clear. And by the way, as I stand here before you, I'm someone who would never want my kids to be ingesting cannabis. Neither do I want them smoking cigarettes. Neither do I want them accessing alcohol. Th these are health risks, but cannabis is no worth a he worse a health risk than the others.